Good morning, sisters and brothers. It is truly a privilege to be able to be sharing with you this morning from the Word of God. I want to invite you to pray with me. God who sees all things, who knows all things, who cares about each and every one of us in this room and across this denomination, I ask that as you speak to us through this word, I pray, O oh God, that what I will share this morning will be that which you, O oh God, can speak in and through me. I'm just a vessel. And may your Holy Spirit minister to your children as they listen. Be glorified because we ask all this in and through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. This morning, I will be speaking to you on the subject of the way of peace in a polarized world. I have tr been traveling lately across the country and in conversations with people within the U.S. and outside of the U.S. and in Canada where I am based, I hear people saying something to this effect. It feels like the American society is falling apart on multiple fronts, politically, socially, spiritually, economically, racially, and in all the other isms that you can think of. I am right and therefore you are wrong. As Americans, we are breaking into tribes of Democrats and tribes of Republicans. And both of these tribes cannot seem to agree on anything, but they do agree, however, on one thing, and that one thing is who should be on power. They want to be in power. We have an idea. We have no idea if the America is still great or if we need to make it great again or if it was even great in the beginning. We believe in freedom, though this freedom can only be, it cannot extend beyond the me. Or sometimes this freedom, we wonder if it includes racial inclusion. And it's God good or should we just trust science? According to the Adam Trust Barometer, 57% of Americans feel as though we are in the middle of a civil cold war. Let that sink in. 57% of Americans think we are in a cold civil war. And the American Institute of uh, reports that 12% of Americans they say they have zero friends. The American Insti uh, Enterprise Institute reported about 12% of the country having zero friends outside of family. Our participation in religion is declining. Earlier this year, Gallup reported 47% of, of Americans belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque, which is a down down, downward number from the 1990s. Trust in national news organizations continue to just spiral down. But the question is, has it always been like this? And so against this backdrop, the question then is, does the scripture has anything to say to us on how we shall live in the midst of this polarization? Or how can we be instruments of God's peace in the middle of polarization? How can you and I be an instrument in God's hand to be able to bring healing to our polarized nature? And from our reading this morning, the writer of Hebrews reminded us by saying, make every effort to live in peace with everyone, for without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Make every effort. It's a lot of effort. It's not just saying casually try. It is saying make every effort to make peace with everyone. And does, in making every effort with everyone does not mean only with the people that you agree with. Make every effort means you make peace at all costs with even the people you disagree with. And that includes your enemy. 
the writer of Hebrew, the book of Hebrew in itself, talk about the salvation, the gift, and everything that God, until it came to this chapter, we know at the beginning, everywhere we read in Hebrew, it talks about the, this, the, this gift that, that God has redeemed man, redeemed creation, redeemed anything, everything. But then we're reminded. When we consider the perception of holiness, we often tend to see it as me, myself, and I, and most especially coming from an individualistic society where we are so self-centered. So holiness is between me, but the, the writer of Hebrew says, well, for without holiness, you no one can see the Lord. And holiness is not just somewhat that is just something inward, but it is inward at the same time reflection of what we and where we live. And we cannot be holy if we're not set apart. In the second scripture in Romans, we read, what does it really mean to, to be set apart in the 21st century? What does it mean to be set apart in a polarized, not American context? So in Romans 12, Paul gives us a warning not to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be renewed by the transforming of our minds, which is our reasonable act of worship. And therefore, Paul, in this context in Romans, Paul was writing a letter to a church that was under the cloud of an empire. And Paul was writing to this church that has a tendency to be absorbed into all the worldly things and the worldly ways of acting and the worldly ways of being. But Paul writes to this church and said, therefore I urge you to make every effort to live, to strive, to do whatever it takes for you to be of a renewed mind. Because Paul knew that the transformation of thinking leads to the transformational way of engaging the world. When our lives are being transformed into the image of God, the creator, it, the, 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 the outward of that is we get then are compelled to be able to live that transformed life in the community. And it is evident by the way we relate with people in our community. It is evident by the way we relate with our families. It is evident by the way we relate with our church folks. It it is evident by the way we relate with people we'll disagree with as we engage in a transformational thinking. God is glorified. What would it look like if we took this Paul's call to live in a transformational life series? What would it look like if Christians receive an invitation to a set apart and a holy life? And what would it look like if we Mennonites take this call serious and say we will be different, we will look and act different, we will treat each other different, we will have a civic, civil conversation with one another in a way that is lifting to each other. I think if the Apostle Paul is to write a letter to the church in America today, he will probably copy and paste what I will call in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I read, it says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. The church has gone so far that the American culture and the American church has gone so far that if, I, if Paul is to write a letter, he will write a letter of rebuke because the church in Corinth at the time when Paul wrote a letter to Corinth, the church was one was saying, I am of Apollos and the other one, one group is saying, and we are of Paul. And today we are not saying I am of Apollos or I am of Paul, but we have really turned that around and said, I am a Democrat. You are a Republican. And as a result of that, we have missed the central core or the centrality of who Jesus is. Our identity has become so hinged in our politics that we're missing the centrality to which Christ has called us. 
So what if we begin to, we, we recenter and return to that centrality of Jesus and begin to identify our sisters and brothers, people will disagree with, when we see them as image bearers of the living God. What if we attempt to do that? When we do that, what we will see is we will no longer see them as enemies or against us, but we will see an image of God in them. What if we believe that the bigger picture of creation, it's bigger than me? Because when, I, when, the, when my identity is hinged in my politics or in whatever isms that I'm caught up in, it deprives me from seeing the whole picture of the beauty of God. But when my identity is in Christ and I can see God in the other, it all of a sudden exposes me to the beauty of God's creation. So when we treat our peacemaking and embrace polarization, we see as being people who have a greater, bigger picture because all of a sudden our view becomes so narrow and we no longer have the, the, bre the, the length and breadth of the view that God intends for us. And so when we pursue peace with people we, we disagree with, when we pursue peace at all costs, what happens is we reflect the image of the one who created us. So, but when we trade our peacemaking for polarization, we stop seeing, we stop even demonstrating what the kingdom of God can look like. So the faulty vision that stands in our way is constantly that of obstruction rather than that of uplifting. But when we engage with everyone as brother and sister, we create opportunity for God to work in us, through us, that the world can look at us and say, indeed, here are followers of Jesus. So Jesus tells us that the children of God must be involved in our, his father's business. And what are we as apprentices, as followers of Jesus? Jesus modeled to us through the Sermon on the Mount that what it means to be a peacemaker, what it means to live in unity, what it means to be in the world that is polarized but not be part of this world. There is a call, brothers and sisters, for us to be holy. And holiness leads to reconciliation. Reconciliation leads to peacemaking in the midst of brokenness. The, the way we live, the way Jesus calls us, when Jesus came, we would have expected, some of us, if Jesus would have acted the way we act today, Jesus would have been acting with the powers that be. But Jesus did not align himself with the empire or the Roman uh, power rulers of his day. Neither did he align himself with the religious leaders. But what Jesus did was he called each and every one to a higher moral accountability. He calls the, those that are in power and those that are the oppressor and the oppressed to a new moral accountability. Sisters and brother, I believe that God is calling us to hold each other to a higher moral accountability. And when we do that, we lift the name of Jesus and Jesus shines in and through us. When people look at us, whose image do they see? When they look at the church, what image do they see? Do they see us as the historic peace church, or do they see us as just another church that is caught up in the divisive nature of today's culture? Do they see us as a church that is caught up in culture war or as a church that reflects Jesus? The call is for us that Jesus becomes the guiding star, the shining star, that we become like the city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Not because we're perfect people, not because we're better than anyone, but because we demonstrate and, and live out a radical love one for another, even in the midst of our disagreement. Yes, I am not saying that you have have to act, agree with everybody, but even in your disagreement, you need to be able to see the image of Jesus in the person you disagree with. And by the way, when we call ourselves historic peace churches, we do not, we did not label that name on our own, on our uh, on ourselves. Our ancestors did not call themselves historic peace churches. It's the communities around them that saw them different, that saw their lives and said, indeed, this is the group of churches that we will consider historic peace. Are we historic? 
And if we are, do we just want to remain on the shelf of history or is there a higher call for us to continue to live out that uh, witness? So God has made peace with us, entrusted us with the ministry of reconciliation, and so we are called to model that. So we must commit to following Jesus into the deep unity of our differences, a reaffirmation of our primary identity as God's beloved children, transformed into the image of God. And when we do that, like the late uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs once said, the challenge to the religious imagination is to see God's image in one who is not in our image. Let that sink in. We are called to be a third way maker. That means Christ into the way of peacemaking. Christ leads us into the way of peacemaking. We have to come to believe that the heart of our conversation is not about Romans 1 or 1 Timothy 1 or Leviticus 1. Rather, the heart of our conversation is not just because we have to agree on all of these passages, but our heart of the heart of our conversation should be, how do I love my brother even when we interpret the scriptures differently? We are convinced that it is about doing this, like really intentionally seeking to leave a third way that we can be able to model to the world. We can be able to even model to one another what it means to follow Jesus. A third way should not be some kind of a middle ground where um, uh, every uh, give a, a, a little bit of a half and you give a little bit of a half, but a third way calls us to be evident, to demonstrate Christ-likeness to a brother, to a sister. The church is called to be redefined, to be defined by a radical and open to the other. My friends, the foundational call of the third way uh, is not some middle of the road, like I have said. It's not some compromise, because Jesus really has demonstrated that for us. We are called to pursue Jesus-centered way, and that way compels us to be a people that will face confrontation and stand in love. That way will be a way of saying that we agree, we may not walk the same line, but Jesus is greater and bigger than all my ideologies. The third way calls us to seize the moral imagination, and that moral imagination allows us to go places that only God can take us. That third way calls us to be a people that will technically say, we stand in the world, but we are not going to be of the world. The culture of the day is not what is going to define the culture of the church, because the culture of the church is not determined by the culture of the world, because Jesus is the center of the church. And if Jesus truly is the center of the church, brothers and sisters, we have to go all the way and love our neighbors, love our brothers and sisters, and even love your enemies. As followers of Jesus, when we face polarizing situation, we need to be asking some third way question because we need to be given a third way response. And the question is, where is the centrality of Jesus in this conversation? My prayer for you, sisters and brothers, is that we will be a church that demonstrate what it means to live in peace, even in the midst of our polarization. And I pray that you will be miniature Christ walking around, building peace and reconciliation in the midst of a polarized world. Let us pray. God, I ask that humanly speaking, we know it is impossible for us to live this higher call but through the enabling power and grace of your spirit, we will say we can. Not because we are smart enough, educated enough, tall enough, short enough, but because we know Jesus is all and in all. Give us the grace and the boldness to demonstrate that in the polarized world that we live in today. We ask all this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say, Amen.